Hello YouTube, Robin Hood Bricks here, and today I thought I'd go through a number of jobs that have been lining up all over my desk, uh, but before I go into those in a lot more detail, I thought I'd run you through some of the amendments I've made that you've suggested over the last few weeks. So one of the major questions I often get asked about the Lego room is what I'm going to do when it is full up. Uh, and the answer to that is that I'm going to do a second pass. That is, go through the entire city again, uh, but basically focusing on any gaps that might exist, where you can see some bare wall or something like that, or where there's something that I'm not 100% happy with or think I can take to the next level. Uh, so usually, therefore, uh, on this first pass that I'm uh, focusing on just filling the room on, uh, I don't tend to revisit things just because I don't want it to slow down our progress too much. Uh, but today is a bit of an exception in that regard, just because there are two fairground uh, builds recently that aren't uh, part of the pile waiting to be integrated together, uh, but have been sort of lingering around my desk uh, because they need a lot more significant further work. Uh, and I think because that further work is significant and uh, they won't be right to integrate until it's done, I think I really have to go back to those uh, and get those fixed for the first pass. So uh, before we get to those two builds, which I'll be doing on my desk, I thought I'd show you some of the uh, more recent amendments, some of which were suggested by you. One was adding some bees to around my beehives. That was one of yours, though I thought of it as well, but uh, I'll give you a bedoing. Uh, one which was mine just from that friend sat in the recent hall. I was trying to find a suitable place to fly a kite and it really needs to be quite high up so it looks good. But I think that's quite good, especially from say that angle where you can see it in the sky. Looking good, just attached to uh, the roof there. Maybe that's the secret sign to uh, let people know where the illegal wrestling uh, is taking place. Uh, at the moment that's happening of course on this rooftop. So maybe that's uh, for people in the know. Uh, what else have I done? Uh, I've done the amendments to this, the shunter on the back. You can see I've added the chains on all four corners there to secure that into position. Uh, a lot of people suggested that. I wasn't sure if that would sort of uh, make the scene a bit more complicated and, and less good as a result. But yeah, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, and I've put the magnets that would have come on the two uh, buffer pieces in this pot as well. So they're sort of going along with it off the scrap, presumably. But uh, yeah, I think I like that. So here's a bedoying for all of you. Uh, then I made quite a few changes to the steam train that we are now calling the Flying Knotsman. So there we are. Uh, I moved what was a bell from about here to here and turned it upside down to make it into a whistle to make it more UK friendly. So I think that's right. And I've blocked in the middle window there and indeed taken off the last window on each of the sides uh, just to make it look less sort of aeroplane-y because uh, some people have suggested that all those sort of aeroplane shaped windows in a row kind of make it look a bit uh, repetitive. So I think that is an improvement. So thanks very much for those. Uh, and while we're here, you can see I've actually managed to put in all of those sort of gunmetal colored uh, tiny one by one round studs there instead of the black or the dark gray. And I think that really has worked. That really does look like coal. And it stands out so much better uh, against the black. So I hope that's a real happy compromise that everyone is happy with. Uh, and just while we're here, that one doesn't get a bedoin because that was mine. <laughs> and just while we're here, uh, I think I have decided to go ahead and make a water tender or, or a canteen, as the Americans call them, uh, to go on the back of this train. So we'll actually have... Uh, or locomotive, I get told off for calling it a train. Um, so we've got three elements to it before we even get to the carriages. And I think that'll house the battery box better uh, and mean that I've got a lot more space in the carriages for uh, passengers. So that's really good. Right, uh, so the other thing that's new is the placement of the museum. And you can see it there kind of nestled in between the very tall GBC factory and the very tall uh, hospital. But I think it looks great there. I mean, you would have older buildings being a bit lower uh, rise because of their age. 
So I think that works really well. And it gives us a really good sort of window frame, if you will, to kind of peer at the fairground beyond once that's all sort of linked together. So I really like that. Uh, and you can see I've done a couple of amendments to that as well. I've done two of the flags on the front sideways. So they are looking up and down the street. And I'm not sure what I think of that. I think it's probably very sensible. Um, but yeah, I kind of liked all four on the front, but uh, I'll stick with it for a while anyway. And here's your Bedoin. Uh, and then another thing you might notice is that the uh, art thief on the roof has actually deployed her catapult gun and it's attached all the way up there on the top of the uh, hospital. So that's where she's going to be making her escape. Maybe she's going to steal the ambulance helicopter or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but we'll go around there and take a closer look uh, and see another couple of small amendments we've made on the inside. So quite a few people suggested that I should have her grappling hook gun deployed. So I've just got a official piece of Lego string from an old sort of reel for a crane or what have you, uh, just so it's uh, compliant with our policy of Lego only parts. Uh, and one end, as you can see, is tied to the grappling hook, which I've kind of clipped to the roof. Kind of a bit of an illegal connection there, but uh, it works. Uh, and the other end I've tied around the remaining gun and she's just uh, taking a slack up and testing it to carry her weight. And there she is with the rather large painting. Goodness knows how she's going to haul that up. Maybe I'll need to give her a net as well. Um, but that's really good. So I'm really glad for that suggestion. There are all sorts of variations on that theme, but here is your Bedoin. <sighs> Uh, and, there, uh, and then on the inside, I've just done two very small changes. I've basically uh, recessed the feet of this just so it kind of hovers a bit more uh, attractively. Uh, and you can't even see it here, but I've actually added cheese wedge pieces to the exposed studs on a back of all of these uh, paintings on the pedestals. So they're just very small amendments that have made it just that little bit better. So here's your Bedoin for both of those. One, two. <laughs> You wouldn't want to share one, would you? So this uh, entire standing hole edge is looking incredibly busy now. You can really see into all of these buildings side by side. And it's really starting to look like that huge guillotine did come down and chop off the back half of all these buildings. Uh, and that is where the stairs for the uh, museum would be, for example, to get from one floor to the other. So, uh, yeah, I think it's starting to look really fun from a very sort of different perspective uh, over here. So we'll have to have another large building here. Uh, and the sweet shop that I temporarily put here, the uh, Honey Dukes, is also up for a refit because we want to make that a lot deeper. Uh, and I haven't got many bricks at all in the right colours, so that's uh, proving problematic. Uh, but while we're over here, I'll just show you my little procession of brand new uh, coloured um, uh, wheelbarrows. There we go. So just got three builders pushing those in a row, kind of uh, echoing what we've got going on with the minis in procession over here. So that's quite good fun. Uh, and I've also added the two chips cops or the uh, normal sort of uh, traffic motorbike cops. And they're looking very mean indeed on their matching bikes, but all importantly with the different numbers on. <laughs> that was uh, harder to achieve than you might imagine. Yeah, so everything's looking really good. So uh, now I'm going to go to the building desk and look at our two uh, things from the fairground that I'm going to give a bit of an overhaul to, uh, even though it's phase one. Okay, so back to the Lego building desk. Now the first one of the two things that I'm revisiting today is our Dizzy Ducks ride. Uh, I think I've given a bedoying for the name, but if not, there we go. Uh, and that one needed quite a bit of rework because it kind of freaked out quite a few people, actually. Because uh, if you think back to what it actually looked like when I gave it its first go, uh, the big beam that came out that had all of the carriages attached kind of came out the centre of the poor little duckling's forehead, which looked very painful and uh, a bit scary. But even more than that, it very much obscured the beak and the rotating eyes from our view. And given that I put so much effort into making the eyes rotate and so on, uh, it really wasn't uh, a great solution. Uh, not only that, but the beak itself was criticised quite a lot. <laughs> and rightly so, I've been a bit lazy uh, in using just a angled plate for it. But 
partially that was because of the motion right in front of it. If I had a great big thing sticking out, uh, then it would actually clash and wouldn't work at all. So, uh, uh, and then we had the little orange feet coming out of the bottom underneath the large eggshell, which didn't really make a lot of sense because, well, is he in it or is he not? Uh, and then I actually had some really great suggestions to make it even better on top of that. Uh, and one of those was to actually add a water element to the ride. So the ducks would actually dip into the water uh, and come out again on their way around. Uh, and that's just a brilliant idea. Uh, and what makes that idea even better is the fact that because of the way my fairground is set up with that cavity for all of the wiring and the motors and things like that, so when it's all put together, it's all hidden, uh, that cavity allows me definitely to go below ground level, of course. So I could uh, basically create a very rough and ready pond by digging out a sort of hole in the uh, earth, getting the hose out and filling it with water. Uh, and that's what I figure the carnies would do to the beautiful park that was uh, there before they arrived. I reckon they've just basically dug a very crude hole for their ride to uh, dip into, rather than it being a sort of integral part of the ride that they put on the back of the lorry. So, without further ado, I'll reintroduce you to our circus ringmaster and our very grumpy man in the little chick suit. <laughs> we'll have to be a duckling suit, I suppose, for this ride. Uh, and bring on my version two. Now, I'm not going to build this in front of your eyes, and that's just because, uh, well, I had bits absolutely everywhere in doing this. Uh, and uh, it was kind of one of those ones you have to do in real time to kind of uh, check it's working every little uh, step of the way. Uh, and what I really didn't <laughs> want to do or couldn't face was taking it all apart, making the original one, and then doing it in front of your very eyes. So what you'll be looking at is is very much the result of that work uh, but it is da, 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 this so there we go I think first impressions you'll already be liking it because you can see the duckling's head uh, now the um, main axle of course is not coming out of here that's where it was before right on the bridge of his nose <laughs> it's now coming out of his kind of bow tie which I've kind of given him here which is a bit of a spacer as well so it's dual purpose uh, and now his feet are kind of on this black pedestal, but he's kind of coming out of the egg. So I think that looks a lot better. Uh, and while we're round the back, you can see how I've done the whole thing. Because before, the reason why uh, the axe was coming out of the middle of his eyes was because there's two mechanisms. One to control the eyes, which is centred around that spot, uh, and another one for all of the spinning carriages, which is centred around here. So having them combined meant that it would have to come out uh, right between the eyes, essentially, uh, and was, well, the most economical way of doing things. But it's not a huge leap of the imagination just to duplicate the mechanism and have one lower down and one in the original spot. So this one drives the eyes and this one drives the actual motion of the carriages. So we can see that there and that is the, well, would be the eyes if they moved very well. Uh, but the biggest change, I think you'd agree, apart from the addition of these fences, which will very much please the health and safety police, uh, I've added, I'm just going to remove those for now, uh, I've added this hole in the ground. Uh, and I kind of wanted it to be quite crude, uh, partially uh, because, well, it's an absolute nightmare with these bright green plates getting any sort of curved shape because they just don't make many pieces in this colour. Uh, just making any hole even is quite difficult because they've made sort of 6x12 plates, 6x6 plates, 4x4, 2x4 and not much else. Oh, I think 4x10. Anyway, it's really hard to make any particular shaped hole. So by using some leaf pieces and kind of another plate, a really large one as it turns out from a friend's set in this uh, medium azure colour, I've been able to make a very sort of crude, if square, hole, uh, which I've tried to sort of uh, blend in a little bit with some brown slopes on the inside and these plant pieces uh, but the result at least is a nice dip in the ground and it is below ground level as it will be and all of this ugly side of course will be hidden when we get there uh, so I can put these fences back and we can give it a powered run so here we go let's uh, plug this in and here we go so you can see each one of those pretty much just touches the plant and actually gets just a little kick you saw he did there. 
not so much her, but definitely him. Maybe he's just very slightly lower. She did as well. So I think that really works. Uh, and now I've put in just a couple of perfunctory steps to sort of indicate where you might get on and off when they're changing people over. And maybe that slides in or folds out or something to get a bit closer. But I think it is a great improvement. And we've still got the wonderful eyes going around. And now you can see the face. Let me just stop that. You can see the raised eyebrow, which I put a lot of effort into and you just really couldn't appreciate. Uh, but the biggest thing is that I've changed the beak. Oh, yes. And really, it's not really a beak, is it? It's a bill, given it's a duck. Uh, so I use that kind of, um, oh, I don't know how you describe that, curved slope, really. But it's kind of one of those ones that go on the back of a car, like it was a sort of... Um, uh, I don't know, streamlined bit or whatever, uh, and then an inverted slope underneath. And that gives this really sort of pleasing, sort of almost join of sort of, <laughs> I want to call it lips, but it's obviously not lips <laughs> in between the middle there. Uh, and it definitely protrudes a lot more. Uh, and that's why I needed this extra sort of half uh, width sort of spacer in there to make it all work. But that kind of makes him look like he's got a dicky bow on uh, and makes him look even more fun, if you ask me. So there we go. There is our much improved Dizzy Ducks ride. Uh, and whether you suggested the hole in the ground, the fences, the steps, or just raising the face or changing the duck bill, I've pretty much assumed that everyone is due a super large bedoying. So here it is for all of you. <laughs> Yeah, you'll have to share that because there's about 20 things and we'll be here all day. So, yeah, I'm really happy with that. And uh, most of all, I'm really happy with you guys pushing me to do it, actually, because I think everything from the sort of shape of the duck, even though he's got a very sort of enlarged head, uh, down to the hole in the ground has been a massive improvement. And I think now you see why I did this as part of my first pass rather than waiting to uh, amend it as part of my second pass, which would be months off. So yeah, I'm really happy. Thanks a lot. Now, the other thing that I got a rather major suggestion over uh, to improve as part of the first wave was my fortune teller lady. Uh, basically, it wasn't to change the hut, because we already did changes like that, just to make it seven wide, to make the stripes work on the back and so on. Uh, but it was actually re with regard to the crystal ball itself. Uh, and I kind of got further inspired by the recent friend set that's got the fortune teller in it as well, because I may well get the piece that's on the inside of the crystal ball with a kind of uh, smiling face and frowning face, which is kind of the sort of symbol for drama, I always think. But anyway, uh, and put that on the inside. Uh, and the reason for that as well is because that's a glow in the dark piece. So if we had a light shining on it, it would very much glow. Ah, I think you can see where I'm going now. So when I had the suggestion to add a light into this whole setup uh, and add a light that would glow uh, a piece as well, as suggested by that set, I thought, well, look, I have to do that on part of the first pass rather than wait for it. Uh, so what I've done is basically created a setup that allows uh, light to get into that dome from underneath. Uh, so therefore, I've had to take away the normal 1x4 uh, brick uh, and replace it with something with a axle hole up the middle. Uh, and there aren't many ways of doing that, not many that are in my collection. So I just got this Technic piece and two 1x2 Technic bricks. And I think that little detail on the side is easy to ignore. Um, not so good is the colour, which is dark grey. I preferred the sort of uh, tan colour or uh, dark tan colour that I had before as the table. Uh, but nonetheless, now we do have a table with an axle hole coming out of the top of it. Uh, and before I put that back, actually, you'll see I've continued that hole into the mat that the table is resting on. So we've got one stud hole missing there. Uh, and as I described earlier, with the difficulty with all these different um, bright green plates in that there aren't many different sizes, uh, it was an absolute nightmare trying to transfer a one-sized uh, hole uh, into the ground level. So what I've actually done is made a two-by-two two hole uh, in that level, because that's as small as I can get, really, without any smaller plates. And, and over that, I've created this little sort of thing made of some bracket pieces uh, and another Technic brick with two holes in it and that's so I can plug a power functions light fitting into that and it will be that hole there that you can see going all the way through to my table uh, and that's where this table and its hole will be hanging over 
because it's all on the half stud actually just because i wanted this sort of rim of purple carpet around the outside it's all sort of mounted on jumpers and so on uh, and then to make the light effect glow even more uh, as a temporary holding measure until i get that glow in the dark piece i've got kind of a spooky colored uh, one by one stud with this uh uh, what's it called spring green uh, but that's important that that's got the hole in of course uh, and then I've got a bright green uh, trans cone there so that can go right on the center there and we can put the dome over that so that bit can be very quickly and easily replaced if we do get that friends piece uh, and then obviously I need my battery box and power functions lights and we'll plug that into that bottom one there Put the wire out of way and it will be completely uh, hidden when we're in the uh, fairground proper and then I can give it its trial run hey now that doesn't glow a great deal uh, given that we've got the uh, massive filming lights on so let me just turn those off very briefly and that makes it a little bit better uh, but when that's a glow in the dark piece I think it will really really shine so let's take a better look at that yeah, looks good. And it looks even more sort of spooky from a slightly higher angle when it starts sort of bouncing around all of the facets in that uh, dome piece. Uh, but yeah, in the right light, that really makes the whole area glow quite eerily. So uh, yeah, I think that's really good. So lights back on. There we go. Uh, now, this does mean uh, you might think that I'm going to start lighting the entire fairground, and I'm not. Uh, partially because I'm not a massive fan of those lighting kits uh, and this is a channel about Lego not lighting kits and electronics so <laughs> I won't be doing that at all but here's one exception uh, these lights come in pairs so I've got a rogue light here now I haven't got a huge range it's going to have to be you know relatively near the uh, fortune teller's hut but I have got a spare light so maybe suggestions, if you can think of any, of something I've already done or maybe something easy that I can do that will be benefiting of one single light in it. I mean, I could put it on the sort of uh, on the inside of this and make it sort of lit from the inside, but I think that will diminish the glow that we get from this one because I'll kind of be competing. So I'm going to keep it just one in this setup uh, and then have this one improving something else. So, yeah, I haven't really got any ideas yet uh, of my own for this one. Uh, so do let me know if you can think of something that will be greatly improved by a single power functions light. Uh, but I think you'll also agree that that was worth the effort to try and make that very subtle change uh, that would go on when we turn on all the rides as well. And this light really isn't doing it justice just because of uh, <laughs> all of the bright lights that I've got surrounding. But uh, I can assure you it is a very good and kind of spooky effect in real life. Uh, and when it's glowing in the dark, I mean, they're really good. And it'll actually stay on even when we turned off the lights as well. So, yeah. So thanks very much for that suggestion as well. Uh, I think that is another great improvement that really makes the uh, channel work better. Uh, all of you giving your suggestions and making me work a little bit harder. So here's a bedoying for that. Thank you. So it's been a bit of a funny video this time in that we've uh, done lots of little things uh, and no real brand new material. Uh, but I do think that all of these little repairs and these uh, more significant changes are very important. Uh, coming from suggestions from you uh, that I very much value, we've improved this quite a lot. But this one over here, the uh, uh, Dizzy Ducks ride, is just night and day. This is about three times as good as it was before. Uh, and is much more than I imagined when I first started out doing it. So I'm incredibly happy with that and grateful to you for your suggestions. So uh, long may that continue. Uh, and with that in mind, there's a couple more things that I need to announce, especially if you don't watch my brick hauls. Uh, I have now got my own PO box that you can send me things, should you wish to. Uh, I announced it on my brick haul just gone. Uh, and the intention for that is not to beg parts from you. If you've got parts that you need, do keep them. <laughs> but I do get a lot of people asking if they can send me something. Uh, and now you can. Uh, and they'll all be unveiled together as part of Brick Hall 100. That's the plan anyway. Uh, assuming I get enough stuff, of course, to make it worthwhile. Uh, we're already on uh, Brick Hall 95, so that makes it about five weeks off. Uh, so that address is Robin Hood Bricks, P.O. Box 11048, Nottingham, NG8, 
9QS. And do remember, if you're not based in the UK, to put UK on the bottom, so it makes it here, uh, and also to mark those customs forms with the word gift, uh, tick that box, and put the value at around £30 or less, because otherwise it may attract a very large uh, import duty uh, charge. So uh, yeah, we want to keep those values down, if at all possible, at least on the outside of the package. Uh, so that is a good announcement. Uh, I think we're going to have an even bigger announcement when I hit the big 20,000 subscribers. Uh, I'm happy to say that this morning, the very big uh, announcement arrived. <laughs> so I'm not going to share what the very big announcement is until we hit that figure. Uh, and then I'll tell you straight away. Uh, but it is a very big and significant uh, development for the channel. Uh, quite an expensive one as well uh, that I'm very looking forward to using and sharing with you. So uh, yeah, I'll say no more on that until we get to the right point. Uh, so it only leaves me to thank you, as always, for watching. It is appreciated. Do remember to like, comment and subscribe for more awesome LEGO videos. And if you value this channel, there are many ways in which you can support it. Do check out the link in the description below. Uh, and next time on Robin Hood Bricks, we'll be doing a normal city update. And I'm thinking I'll probably do the Daily Bugle and maybe bring that into the city and maybe give you a quick whistle stop review. If you want an in-depth review, do let me know. But uh, I figure I'll just do sort of five minutes or maybe 10 minutes on that and see what my plans are for placing it in the city and uh, amendments. Because you know me, I can't leave anything untouched. So I think that'll be really good fun. So until then, see you.